name's Warren Eagles. I'm a colorist uh, based here in Brisbane. This is my color shop and I color everything from feature films down to YouTube skateboarding videos. So everything in between really. The most important thing about coloring is primary balance. It's just getting the picture. Doesn't matter what camera you're shooting on, they're all shooting in like different color spaces or gammas or profiles. It's just being able to balance that out as evenly as possible and that's something that people tend to forget about or they race on to do other things and I'd say that's the most important thing and that takes time and that takes practice but that for me. Obviously you've got to have a good understanding of the software you're using and there's a number of different color correction softwares that you can use. Uh, I use Resolve, been using it for a long time when it was a very expensive software but you've got things like you know, Baselight and Scratch and you can color create in editing software. Really get to know the software so you've got confidence. So when a director asks you something, you know you can do it and you get that through practice. Then obviously the idea of what the colorist has got to do, you have to balance the scene. So what I talked about earlier, we balance the profiles of the cameras. We then create a look or something that aids the film. So it's, you're helping the director as part of the team to sell the idea. Now, whether that's a feature film, could be a horror look, could be a more of a, a comedy, a warmer, happier feel. And it's the same in commercials or music videos. You know, in a music video, you've always got product. That's your lead singer or your band, commercial, it's your pack shot, it's the car. Always think about your product and thinking, am I doing something to make this look better. If you're not, then you probably don't need to do it. But constantly ask yourself, am I improving the product? Different devices, products, laptops, iPads, TV, cinema, biggest you know, question I get asked all the time. And it's not just in the higher end, the lower, every form of color correction. And we've always had this problem. Uh, back in the day, we'd have a hero monitor in the post house and people have their little four by three telly at home would always look slightly different. And we've got the same today, but today we've got a lot more internet viewing. Sometimes I will do jobs that just gonna be viewed on the web. Now, if that's the case, what I will do, I will trim up my ISO or Flanders slightly based on the fact it's just going to be an internet only commercial. The problem with that is so many things now may end up on TV. They may end up getting a cinema version. So what I say is this monitor, if I'm using my Flanders, I'm using my ISO, is calibrated. So someone comes in and does this for me, I, I don't do this. And I say, I have confidence that wherever this goes, it's gonna look very close to what you see here. It will always be different because there's different technologies. Different technologies are where PC, but I think one of the greatest differences is where people view the content. You know, they could be viewing on an iPad that's not slightly, if you tilt an iPad slightly different or a laptop, it's gonna look different. They could be outside, there could be other things in the environment that really impacts how they see things. But just try and give them the confidence that yes, here it's good. So you can take this and transform it to something else, but it will be different because there's different technologies. And that's one of the things we really can't get away from. But as a colorist, you've got to have confidence in your monitoring because if you don't have confidence, there's no way you're going to convey that to a director or producer if you're saying, oh, well, I think it's sort of calibrated. It's no good. People often ask me about LUTs. Do I use them? Am I in favor of them? And I say both. I've got some set LUTs that I use and they tend to be more from the camera manufacturers that are putting me in a standard starting space rather than say a creative LUT. LUTs can create really cool looks and you can make them. I've made them here in Resolve, DPs have given them to me, I can import them. The only problem probably from a learning point of view is a LUT will create a great picture you have no understanding how it was made. So he does it on the graphics card of the machine. So it doesn't change any of the settings in your base light or your resolve so you can understand how it was made. It either really looks good or it doesn't. 
And the problem I see people run into is it'll look great on a wide shot. They go to the close up and it's not quite right. So they're sort of grading around it and under it and then they're creating other layers or shapes or nodes trying to correct that. The alert is a little bit like your Tom Tom in your car. If you use your Tom Tom or your GPS, you get straight to where you're going. Next time you have to go there, you have no memory of how you got there. So use your Tom Tom again and you get there. If you sit down with a map and you work out where you gotta go, like you sit down with your grade and you work out what you gotta do, next time chances are you will remember how you did it. And that's how you start to learn. You start to go, well, I know how to make that work. So my role in coloring is if I can get involved early, I will. A lot of the time though, I only get involved in when it's been shot and everyone's going, oh, we really should color this movie. You know, who should we talk to? Not ideal, but that's just the way it is. Then my main job is to bring all these assets. Now, I can't remember the last time I worked on a show, even a commercial, it was shot on one camera. Everything now may have a second camera, it might be a black magic with an array or a red and an array. There's always seems to be a drone in shot now. So I've got to bring these assets together, try and match them so it's quite seamless. So the viewer's not jarring. Why is that different? As soon as they question anything technically or why something looks different, you've lost them because they're then out the story. Once I've done that, I'll sit with the director, producer, DP and decide how we can make things better to tell that story. The biggest compliment that I ever get is when a director says, I didn't think we'd color it that way. What you showed me there, I really like, but I didn't think we'd do it like that. And that's the biggest thing, and that's how you can get people to come back to you next time because they go, oh yeah, Warren showed me this thing and yeah, I think he'd be great for this next job. People are using cheaper cameras, lighting's become cheaper. It's been easier to do things. Still not easy to get a great script, obviously. So I am being asked to do a bit more than probably what I used to do in terms of, or oh, can you just fix that? Or can you remove that scar on the side of someone's face? And I can do similar things like that. So more probably beauty work, fixing up uh, looks, making people look slightly younger, probably more appealing. I have this, this idea for one of my ICA classes, it's gonna, the class is gonna be called Make the CEO Look Better. Because a lot of time I do jobs where the actual boss of the company who's in the, say a corporate or branded corporate, they're actually in the film and they wanna look as good as they can. And just understanding what you can do and you can't do, and you can do a huge amount in software now at a relatively cheap price, is what I'm tending to do more. I don't edit, I don't shoot, I don't want to do the sound, I just really want to color, but I'm starting to do more things in that role. I've done things where I've done subtitling and things like that. I've done things where I've done lower thirds. I don't do end credits because they are way too painful for me. I've been running off GTEC drives here probably for about two years in my room. If I'm not thinking or even having to talk about the storage, that's good because it's just doing its job, it's just working in the background. And so these drives have been great. The actual feature that I'm working on at the moment, directors delivered me the whole project on a GTEC drive. So I plug it into my system. I can work from that without having to copy everything to my system. Obviously I do have a copy for backup purposes, I can just work straight off that drive because it's fast enough for me to do so, which is gonna save time. Keeping track of your files, raw files, ProRes files, within my little facility here is important because I do find I tend to get a little bit of repeat on jobs and a client will ring up and say, oh, you know that job we did a month ago, uh, we need to make a change, I'm gonna send you some new shots, so I download those. So I have, a, my recent work that I've got on my G drives here, but I've also got other assets and older projects that I keep on another drive so I can easily pull those back, add those into the current session, because otherwise you can chew a lot of time looking for stuff. So I always say a little bit of time spent at the end of the job, back up that job, back up that project, 
export the stills if you need to, put that on a drive somewhere away so you're normally keeping things in both places. Because from a client's point of view, oh, I'm just gonna send you two new shots, can you insert into that 30 second ad? To them, that's probably an hour's work. But if you've really got to hunt and find these jobs and where's all the grades, that can take into quite a long time. So you wanna be really organized with that. So it is very important. I don't keep all of the rushes from a job. I keep the final job, I keep my projects, and then the rushes, the wilds, if you like, from that job is kept with a client. Now what they do with it is up to them. I'm not keeping everything here. That's just the way I work. Skin tones is really interesting. I ran a session at NAB at the big trade show in Las Vegas, and we polled the audience of about 100 people what was their biggest issue in color correction. And about 50% came up and we want to know more about skin tones. And I think the problem is with that is, is as producers and directors, we're very keen on the hero talent. The hero talent in your program has to look really good because I often say they're probably getting half of the budget or more. So we're really focused on them. So A, we've got to make them look good. Then we've got these different cameras shooting in different color spaces and gamma curves. We've got different lights casting different shades, different color temperatures. So it is very important. My advice would be sometimes work in a color managed workflow where each camera is working in its own color space will make them easier to match those cameras together. Once you have the match, you can then turn it into say a Rec 709 for your finish and then color grade it into a certain look. And when we're grading a strong look, often that does not work for our hero talent or our car. Like if our car is in some zombie world and it all goes green and it's you know, BMW red or Chevrolet red, and the clients might say, well, hang on, that's not our car color for this year. Then you're gonna have a way of manipulating back, get that color back through, through the zombie look, or the skin tone of your hero actor or actress. So you've always got to bear in mind and always think, what is the client thinking? What are they looking at? I love this look, but if it's too strong on the person or on the eyes, then likely it's gonna to be too much and you're gonna be backing out of it. So it is important skin tones and it's just practice. That's my advice to anyone. Uh, we often joke, fix it on post. We have these t-shirts, fix it on set. Problem is that as DPs, as shooters, we don't have any more time. We're rushing around really quickly. One thing I always advise, if you can get one of these charts in, this is like an X right chart. And if you can hold that, we only need like a second of that in the setup that you're in. And it's just really useful to be able to just, I, you can auto match to this, so you can auto balance to this chart. Or just having uh, some gray in the frame, so then you can make that neutral gray. You have just gives yourself a neutral reference and a starting point. So you can grade this to a neutral, then take that away, look at the skin tone, and just compare the two. And color temperature is really important. I don't see maybe DPs checking color temperature enough because that's the sort of biggest inconsistency I see between cameras is maybe lot metering that and checking that the color temperature is gonna be the same between the two cameras. Like I said earlier, we are seeing more and more cameras all use multiple cameras on shoots and it takes a long time. So those things make my job a little bit easier. You can reach me at warreneagles.com.au, which is my coloring website. iColorist.com is a training website and the Color Tour podcast is available on iColorist or just search for it in iTunes or where you normally find your uh, podcasts. And that's me talking to colorists around the world about what they do, what they like, what they color, and the locations that they're in. So we spend half the time in their room, half the time chatting in a local bar or restaurant.